Sorry, I'm going to make a record. Thank you. Uh, share my uh, okay. Mm. Uh, I I haven't seen it now. Now it's yes. It's okay. Okay. Yes, it's okay. Okay, uh, dear friends, uh, especially like a uh, lone one, <laughs> and uh, we ask us and uh, uh, my, uh, all great honor to give a presentation about the uh, Freeman innovation system, and I think uh, the implication for China. Uh, this is a say is a long story. Is that uh, so? I think. Uh, uh, really, this is also a good op opportunity for me and for Chinese friends to think about in the last uh, maybe I think 30 years how the concept of innovation and uh, innovation system came into China and also how can I think change the China also. And uh, so this is a yeah, attribute to Chris Freeman for this uh, 100 years. Yeah, and, and, uh, as we know that uh, he was uh, the first scholar to propose the concept of innovation system. But uh, as he, he, as he said also, the first person maybe is a little one and uh, uh, to use the national innovation system. But anyway, the concept is, I think, uh, is very, very important. So to think about uh, when we think about the innovation is important, but how can we are more, say, uh, Framework to think about you know which, how you know which happens in some of the uh, institutional framework. So I think uh, the national university system is uh, why is so important uh, even today. And uh, yeah, as we know, in 1987, his uh, famous book about the uh, Japan's experience. So I think uh, it's uh, very interesting that uh, we talking about the national university system. Maybe uh, he's the first. Uh, uh, country he tried to to explain is uh, Japan is an Asian country, so I think uh, in some way national Asian system and Asian country maybe have a more in some way more favorable more favorable to to uh, in, in, to apply this concept, and uh, I think the key thing is that uh, for innovation we all say like uh, there is a networking. University and your uh, research, I think, uh, uh, institutions, uh, even I think, uh, business, specialized enterprises and uh, assets are all very, very important. I think uh, there's a social and a private network. And then also, yeah, his uh, important uh, book is early, in, I think, also in 1997. So those are, I think, uh, the key his uh, outputs. And uh, I think, as I remember, well, maybe uh, Xiela and Feng Xin is not here. As I, as I know, the first innovation system, national innovation system concept that came to China is about in 1995. In that time, I think a team led by a Canadian called RDRC, because it's supported by Canadian RDRC. But the key advisor is from uh, Oldham, and it's uh, from Supro. And also, I think, uh, including Satmai and uh, several others. In that uh, event, is about uh, China has already done some of uh, SNT, we call the science technology uh, reform for 10 years. Then China said, oh, how are we going, uh, how to evaluate our current uh, performance and what will be next uh, direction for our future? So I think in Odom and uh, others, to say, oh, okay, OECD has published some book, some of report on national innovation system. China, especially like your most Ministry of Science Technology, uh, is best, I think, uh, to give fundamental thinking is that how can we use national innovation system for Chinese thinking, for your institutional reform, for strategic making. So I say in that time that Maybe uh, Odom mentioned as uh, yeah Freeman even long the while, but uh, in some time he also mentioned as uh, OECD because you know in China is a, a government like to say oh this is an international organization's report 
So it can be more, I say, like legitimacy. So uh, when that kind of, uh, say, big important and so final a book in Chinese, I think it's in 1998, some, some years later. But uh, in that time, I think the national innovation system, I say, gave uh, Chinese scholars, uh, policy makers a shock. Oh, really, there's a such a good idea. And how can we? This idea help China for our policy making. And in also later on, in, I was uh, researching in most, so mo most set up a team to do a special research on national innovation system. So this is a book edited by me, published in Chinese in 1999. I think this is a, um, a, a Chinese version for national innovation system in 1991. And also I think I have a, like, a, you can see the citation and the publication from 1997. So more and more papers, I think books in China, is about the national university system. In some ways, a, I think it's a, a wave, like uh, many, many uh, follows in, for different level and even regional university you know, system and so on, so on. So I think uh, gradually the national university system became a very to hot topic. But uh, some, I think uh, one important event is uh, 19, about 1997. Uh, in that time, the Chinese academic sciences I think in that time, Chinese academic science is in some kind of a crisis because he lost his like uh, uh, usually a high dominant position in Chinese you know, uh, uh, system. But uh, case because they uh, will call it market economy and the government sometimes cut, cut our budget and I think university seems to work well. So cast I think worried. So in case say national innovation you know, system is a good uh, concept for us to think of how can say we need a, a new kind of innovation you know, system. So CAS write uh, for a very important report and try to do something called a non national knowledge innovation you know, engineering in 1997. So in this report, I think endorsed by the former president Jiang Zemin. He will say, okay, National innovation system is really a good policy framework. We should build a Chinese innovation system. So this is, I think, then Cass uh, say, okay, this idea was uh, legitimacy and saying, what can we do? So Cass say, okay, we are the main actor in knowledge innovation. And so the government have to give us more budget. <laughs> and we also uh, have, we have to say a, a, a kind of a reform. So reform means that we can try to hire global talent. So in, in the early time, we have called 100 talent for CAS. But this is the first time in China say uh, talent people is important for innovation. So I think this is a, in that time, as I know, like China, the country still has limited budget. So, Zhongji said, we don't have a, a, a package of money. If you can uh, attract one talent people, we can give you some of uh, budget, okay? So I think that's the one by case by case. So, but anyway, you know, so CAS has restructured and it become more stronger. But as it, so the thing on, I think, this I think give Chinese uh, policy maker a really uh, different uh, act, uh, perspective to see how innovation is going on. Because uh, in my paper in, with White uh, in 2001, in research policy, we say that uh, usually we think enterprises is a factory, not an innovation actor. Because we will say innovation can be done by university, by uh, like a class or by some of called industrial research institute. But uh, since national innovation system idea came to China, I think we say we should uh, uh, focus enterprises rather than just the university and the CAS and applied research institute. So I think this is a fundamentally, I think, change the Chinese uh, uh, policy making. So I learned, I think, in 1999, uh, there's a research team led by most. But I know, like uh, uh, supported by British Council, 
we visited uh, uh, uh and then uh, we have uh, half a day with a free man, free man. We, I think this is uh, my uh, that, uh, director uh, uh, in, in, yes, uh, talk with Freeman about a half a day. And also in the time we uh, has uh, Ben Martin also gave us a talk on foresight. So but in the time, uh, UK become uh, as a, a very important country because many important scholars in UK. So we have uh, about, I think, maybe two weeks uh, travel in different universities in UK, uh, organized by British uh, Council. I think that is a really very good experience for Chinese policy maker and um, like researcher like me. And the same we say we can deeply understand what's called the innovation system. And we also, uh, I think uh, one year later, uh, the British Council even uh, sent uh, several books presented to most. So this is one of them. You can see there's a, a British um, like embassy or, or the British Council. In, in, say from English book, because in, in that time we are still not like today, so we can buy many, many books as, as far as we can. But in that time we are limited budget, so I think it's really very good experience for us in, in 1999. And in 2004, and I with my colleagues also translated three months this book, uh, the economic, the industrial innovation into Chinese. I think this is also the first one in, uh, called uh, you know, the economics of you know, innovation is similar work uh, published in Chinese in the first one, I think. I think because this book, many of my friends or the young say, okay, this is a, say also uh, a book to show how to understand uh, innovation and uh, for especially I think for industrial innovation. So I think this book is uh, very, very important for China. And this year or next year, this book will be republished again in, in China. So I think following those kind of events and uh, the national innovation system became uh, very, very, very important and also especially for policy making. So in, uh, by about 2000, I think in, especially we have called the long range program 2006 to 2020. And then also we say, uh, formally say, China have to build our own innovation system. And it was very interesting to see that the, the national innovation system we, we was designed to have this Chinese way, five different parts. One is called the technology innovation system with the main actor is the enterprises. One is called the knowledge innovation system with the university as the main actor. One is called the regional innovation system. One is called the military civil integrated innovation system. And lastly, the networking of SNT service system. So anyway, China, I think in that time in our program, we try to say in our national innovation system, there's different actors and and so we have a different five different parts. So this is a good way for Chinese authority to think about how can support them different, differently in different way. So this is, I think, uh, for a long time, this is what I call this very official way to think about the national innovation system in China. And uh, I think it's a uh, uh, latest the work for innovation system collaboration is uh, formed with OECD about 2007. And uh, Xie Lan, uh, me and uh, Mu Yongping, we are deeply involved with this project. And this project also uh, supported by uh, Ministry of Science and Technology because OECD has a limited budget. So most of have to provide the resources. And in that time also, we have many, many, I think, uh, interview in China and also lots of workshop things to work together. This is uh, called the OECD Review of Innovation Policy. I think the main uh, framework is the uh, innovation system. And uh, we use the, the system again and to evaluate the Chinese progress and also what is the value and what is the uh, next, uh, for, for example, like uh, uh, the new policy tool. For example, in this report, uh, like uh, a friend of mine, I think, in Germany, is, uh, uh, Jakubi Eldler, 
uh, he left what's called the public procurement can be very important. So in this report, we will say China should have more policy from public procurement. So I think this is also reflected in our long range program. And uh, now I think uh, in today, I think uh, the national university system become more and more say Chinese way. For example, China will say we need more independent or indigenous innovation. So that we have to be thinking about how can we, for example, that to have to strengthen our uh, indigenous innovation capability. So from I think from 2010 to now, the whole idea is that how can China implement a, a new kind of we call it innovation driven development. And also I think in, in here, the uh, national innovation system still our key concept, uh, but uh, usually is uh, in different way. For example, uh, as far as I can say is that now, uh, the government knows that China uh, catched with the developed countries, uh, the, the gap is more narrow and uh, we are say more closely or say with the developed country. So we have to change our, uh, I think development strategy. For example, in those years, we are more and more thinking China should have uh, care more basic research, more on rad radical innovation, more on green innovation, more on social innovation. So in some ways that the so early time, we just say, oh, innovation system, so enterprises is the key actor. But now, yes, that is already, I think, realized. So today, I think the Chinese thinking about the innovation system is thinking more is that who can be the, our main like uh, actor for to be more good in radical innovation, to master more called key technology. So that can make more Chinese development in a more, in some way called more indigenous. So I think this is a, um, a new development. So my conclusion is that the, so in the last 30 years, I think uh, Freeman and his idea of uh, national innovation system and inspired many scholars, and many government agencies. And uh, I think uh, not about the, is China, uh, to give China a totally a new and also very uh, good uh, um, thinking uh, policy framework uh, even today. And uh, in those time, I think Freeman, Nelson, Lundwa, uh, their research for innovation system had a profound uh, you know, impact on Chinese uh, innovation system development. Yes, in, in this time also, I think as a Chinese scholars like me, Xie Lan, Feng Xin, even Qing Jing, I think here, we are doing all our Chinese research and all I think made uh, to Chinese innovation and development has a very wide impact. Okay, so this is my, my I think, uh, presentation and uh, thanks for your listening and for your attention. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much and the, and the lecture from, uh, yeah, from Professor Liu. And mm. uh, in fact, you show that's the whole the history mm. <laughs> and some of the his, historic the documents we haven't seen uh, for a long time. <laughs> And thank you so much, and, uh, and for uh, for Professor Liu. And now we welcome Professor Wang Qing, and uh, she will give uh, share her experience and uh, opinions on the innovation system. Yeah, welcome. Thank you so much, Jing. Do you we? I see a the question in the chat box by Professor Lindvall. Do yeah. you want um, uh, Xie Ling to respond to that before we move on to my presentation? <laughs> uh, I think it, I think it's that is a, perhaps it's a question yeah, to all of us. I think mm -hmm. so. Uh, the question is very interesting on the introduction mm -hmm. of NIS concept in China. In my mm -hmm. work with Xie uh, Ling Hu, we mm -hmm. argue that decentralization and the local experimentation has been the strength of China and SI. Do you agree? And <laughs> is it still so? So the mm. role of the local government 
Okay, I think in 1990s, this is sure that uh, I think uh, Lonoa is right, is that in that time, decentralization and uh, experimentation from bottom up, I think, provide a lot of uh, yeah, innovation practice for China and also in policy practice. So I think in, in that time, right. So, but uh, in the, uh, after I think the latest stages, is more, as I have, as far as I understand, China, China will be say, for example, for national immune system is more like actors, uh, say, oh, which one is most important. So the first thing I think we all, uh, all agree, is a enterprise is a key actor. I think this kind of transition or tra uh, different way to thinking which one is important can be very fundamental because in a long, long time, really is a, most of the budget, most of the resources for universities, for uh, research institutes, not, we don't care about enterprises. So I think in national universities, you know, the first important thing is about uh, enterprises as a main actor. The second issue is, uh, I think, is from CAS called Knowledge Innovation in the Engineering Program. In that way, is to tell Chinese government is that knowledge is a more important key elements or impose then maybe just the capital. This, this maybe are not very clear is that the national music system, this is kind of uh, program told the Chinese government is knowledge as we one thing we have said knowledge economy is comparable in that time. So the so Chinese government realized really knowledge, technology can be so important in our economic development. So I think this is a fundamentally Change the Chinese government idea. So, so why I say, okay, we should support the university. We should support the CAS. I think this is a, the second stage. So, uh, London is the first stage. The second stage for the you know, system. So, what impact is uh, give CAS more money, give you know, university more money. So, you can say, world class university, 1998, uh, uh, is a uh, First, the Jiang Zemin in Peking University for 100 years anniversary. He said, China has to be, have a one uh, world class university. Why need a world class university? Because knowledge is so important. So I think national university system uh, comp uh, also is aligned with the uh, knowledge economy, changes the Chinese society to say, okay, knowledge, innovation, uh, technology was all the key, I think, elements, uh, driver for Chinese development. So I think we can see like two stages. The first stage is, is long one. The second stage is more uh, top down. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Can you hear, can you hear me? Yes. 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 You see my slides? Yes. Okay, good. Okay. Um, again, uh, I see a few familiar faces, some old friends, uh, apart from Professor Lundeville, uh, we, you know, we met a few times, sometimes in Spru, actually in Qinghua, early stage, we were both visiting scholars uh, in Qinghua, and actually Xielan's uh, invitation. Uh, I, I also see Carlotta. Uh, I'm so pleased to hear, to see you here. Uh, I know how much Hello, you haven't changed. Um, amazing. How are you keeping with all those COVID stuff? Okay, very good. Yeah, so I, I am really honored and actually humbled to be invited to give this uh, talk on uh, my experience of working uh, with Chris uh, as a colleague in Spru. Um, so um, I wanted to tell you how much he has influenced my research without me knowing at the first, because he, he was such a great thinker and deep thinker and that's prolific uh, res researchers, authors, published in so many different uh, areas, uh, I mean, around the national system innovation, but much more profound than that. I think in general, science and technology policy related issues. Uh, so my life uh, at SPRU uh, was when I was 33, 
and I, that was 1995. I'm revealing my age now, but never mind. I was young then, at least. And so I want to tell you this because uh, I, I, I went from Warwick uh, Business School. As you know, it's very kind of un enterprise-based, right? Company, corporate-based type of uh, research. Um, went to Spru and it's very policy level, but I was brought in to actually bring in the comp company uh, company perspective because Spru has um, science policy uh, master's degree in a master's in science, science policy. But we wanted to have a master's in technology and innovation management, which is firm level, looking at the organization level, how organization innovate. Um, so, I, so I think in a sense that's very complementary, but also it's really, really, uh, really useful for me to see outside, you know, to really look at the link between the policy, government policy and for firm strategies or firm capabilities how these two are interconnected. Um, and I think that really provides a very, very, uh, very, very um, in huge insight for me. Um, and Chris has been, Chris is such a um, great t speaker and very eloquent as well. So he can, he could speak nonstop and he could link his knowledge is so broad and deep. And you, you sometimes, I certainly found it hard to follow him, but certainly uh, it was very eye-opening. Um, and I also worked with a few other uh, colleagues that like Nick von Tonsman, a, a business historian or um, um, in the economist. Um, and so we looked at this long, kind of long-term uh, effect, you know, of technological change on industries, sectors over time. And the complexity because of the technological change has brought in so many layers of complexity. And so we all have worked in this, I think, this, um, this, this field of trying to understand the, the, the influence of science and technology policies on firm behavior. For, for me, that's what I'm particularly interested in. Uh, we all heard about this visible hand, invisible hand. We heard about why do we need, you know, there are different models of uh, policy uh, making, uh, industrial policies. Uh, the Western model now we say, in the Chinese model, maybe a free market model where a small government and a big market. So they have been that kind of debate ongoing. So uh, very much that has really, so uh, Professor Liu has said so much about the, the background, about how China come to really embrace in national system innovation. It was such a huge, I think, uh, really useful, very helpful uh, policy concept and policy tool to, to help uh, Chinese uh, government uh, you know how important that period is, 1979, when China just started to open up, started to understand the role of government uh, in, in, a, in a market economy rather than a planned economy. Um, and Chinese government uh, have really embraced that concept. In fact, I was invited by Xilan and there was a plan, there was a called 865, there was one of the government earlier government plans and we need to go and we came and we provided some kind of uh, advice on, on, on the implementation of that plan, which is again, as Professor Liu has very much uh, thoroughly explained, the purpose of having those plans was to uh, bring in knowledge and in the center, they call knowledge is, uh, is knowledge is productivity, knowledge is productive. Right, uh, so they, uh, that has been uh, very much the backdrop. But what I like to talk about more is 
what, what we're trying to understand 30 years after this national system of innovation has been concept that's been introduced in China uh, and what China has become now compared to 30 years ago. And we as scholar, um, so really try to understand um, what happened uh, to this uh, China science technology policy, uh, what have made uh, the country uh, economically a, a success story. Uh, so we, uh, we all know that unless it really uh, increase the competitiveness of the companies, the competitiveness of the industries, you are not going to be a long-term uh, success story. Um, and uh, Chris really looked at uh, this shift in world leadership and the role of innovation in this process. So we could argue in the very early stages of China's opening up and China's economic development, we could argue that China had no innovation, it was imitation, it was low cost labor, but that wasn't, uh, wasn't the case anymore. So, so how did China cross that cusp to become innovator innovation leaders or technological leaders in some areas at least. Um, and and uh, uh, the, uh, the, the also the increasing, Chris, Chris is so visionary. He really foresee some of the things which are actually happening now. I feel like, you know, he looked at the increasing importance of big companies uh, become network leaders. And this is actually what I have been researching on with my colleagues in Zhejiang University to look at the role of the state-owned enterprises who are huge companies, who are very resourceful, who, who played a key role in integrating and connecting different parts of the economy and start some really huge projects. For example, the high-speed rail project uh, was, of course, by that uh, uh, state-owned enterprise called C uh, China um, CCTC. Uh, you know the the um, the China China company that produced the ro royal ro rolling rolling railway rolling company. So really, this is also what we are seeing now in China: the role of the state-owned enterprises. And again, I'm really, I'm really happy, uh, Professor Lindevall is here because we I've ju just read your 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 uh, article in the latest issue of Research Policy, which introduced the concept of corporate innovation system and looking at the co-evolution or interaction between the national policy, national system innovation and the corporate system innovation at your proposition of these two have to, to interconnect in order to push the economy forward. And you looked at artificial intelligence and look at how that particular sector is, is, um, is manifesting some of those characteristics. And myself with my colleagues in Zhejiang University are looking at a few other industries, including the, uh, the, uh, the surveillance industry uh, that is becoming very successful, including the new energy, a uh, new vehicle, new energy vehicle industry, uh, which is also very successful. But we also looked at a couple of and not so successful uh, industries like the semiconductors, uh, the chips, and also the pharmaceuticals. So we wanted to really compare and see if the government policy, uh, you know, the government national system innovation uh, is so effective in connecting the dots um, and filling the gaps um, in the marketplace and somehow uh, creates uh, some kind of uh, a competitive environment for uh, for for different actors to to develop their uh, capabilities uh, in that environment. How come doesn't happen in all areas or industries? So very much the the kind of questions that we have in mind now. So this is really one of the examples of what uh, we have working we have been working on, and we have this is published. Um, well, we published uh, uh, a paper 
uh, in the research uh, in the R and D management uh, in uh, last year, uh, which we proposed. We also tested empirically the existence of this so-called institution-led market, and um, which then we we really say why it is called institution-led market. In Chinese, it's called the xing shi chang, which means the institution has a role which is quite unique in the emerging, uh, emerging economies compared to the role of institutions in the uh, developed economy. And I try to explain a little bit uh, what we have done in this work. In this work. So we found that uh, in very much uh, institution, institutional environment in the emerging market has always been put on a kind of slightly negative lens of 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 uh, of saying it's actually a void. You know, doesn't have uh, a well established uh, information. Uh, you know, there's an information problem. Uh, there, there are misguided regulations. There are some sort of inefficiency in the judicial systems, but then. This is an angle which has been slightly Western centric because inefficiency happens everywhere. Inefficiency happens in the West. The, you know, it, so it shouldn't really just be something unique that emerging market institutions have. Um, and however, we also need to look at the strengths of some of these institutions. So we try to also look at, so we try to take a more um, objective uh, lens uh, and try to look at everything, the, the good and bad, and you know, we try to see what are good then about the institutional environment, which have somehow developed some very strong uh, economy, but also very strong industries and very strong companies. Uh, so what is it uh, so, which is unique? And so this is really is sort of echoing uh, some of the cause for the need for a theory uh, a theory of you know um, of China um, of of Chinese management rather than just to adapt the Western management theory to Chinese context. Uh, so this has you know Barney and John started this debate, but this debate has become uh, more prevalent uh, more recently. Uh, Bruton, for example, Gary uh, Bruton also published in uh, in the um, uh, strategic. Uh, management journal, I believe, uh, quite recently about a uh, need for indigenous theory of Chinese management to understand uh, yeah. what it is that is not explainable just by uh, uh, applying Western context. Uh, so firstly, we, we, we do need to understand um, uh, in this context, right, you know, how can uh, how can emerging market enterprises grow if the, the institutions just basically quite weak? So what is it that actually give them that advantage and they actually grow stronger? Um, and what influence does the home institution environment have on the capability development of MNEs who, uh, in the sense who they not only have advantages when they are competing in their own home market, but they also have a com uh, have advantages when they are competing, when they go abroad. So some of the companies that we studied, for example, Hike Vision, um, it was, of course, a, a state-owned enterprise and it was developed, it was built uh, in 2001, uh, in a sense, become a joint venture and eventually, and of course, it became a, a, the sort of the, the, the leading player in in the domestic market, helped by the Chinese government the policy of safe China. Uh, uh, however, gradually, not only it has become very strong inside in home market, it also become very strong uh, internationally, become a, a very um, competitive multinational company in many other countries. So we really wanted to follow that and to understand what have uh, give them that advantage going abroad as well. So we uh, we wanted this. So this is really what we try to define what the institution-led market is. Um, so and and how it influences the emerging market capability building and and when they are confronted with a different degree of technological discontinuity uh, in particular. Um, so uh, we we looked at a few things like there have been con uh, there have been research on 
um, entrepreneurship, in particular, looking at state entrepreneurship. So this is one of the concepts that we thought was quite useful um, to look at. Uh, so we, we looked at, uh, the, so um, I just put it here because I don't have time to explain that in detail, but if you have, you know, if you disagree with me or you have any other comments on this, and we feel that the Chinese government has performed more than just uh, as, um, you know, resource allocation or, or market order uh, regulation uh, it, or, or procurement, uh, government procurement. It's more than that. It's more of demand creation. It really created quite a lot of uh, new markets, new demand. Uh, for example, the early example I give, the high-speed rail market and the safe China market. And now the environmental sustainability uh, became a top priority for the government, which again created some new uh, new market demand uh, for, for, the, for the country and therefore for the, for the uh, companies to try to uh, fill the need or, or try to try to you know try to compete in that new market. Uh, so we, we really look at that, this uh, multifaceted nature of government uh, in emerging markets. Uh, we feel like they, all, they, they, they have a market-driven mechanism, and I'm going to explain how that ha works. I mean, this is sort of conceptualization, and we try to say, well, how does that, how is that implemented? What does that mean for the government? What do they need to do uh, to, to do that? Uh, so this is what I mentioned earlier about the, the, the paper we published on the management and uh, looked at the definition of institution-led market. Um, uh, so it's market demand creation, institutional resource support. So this is sort of two dimensions. Um, uh, both are very important. So not like one is peripheral and one central, they both are very important. Okay. Sorry, I'm just having to uh, go through a bit quick, quicker. I, I'm uh, conscious of time. Uh, so I wanted to come to this slides because this slide is where we found um, uh, what the government, so, so the government has managed to create the demand and, and provide resource support and they implement that uh, vision, if you like, of government long-term vision by having the, uh, the SOEs as the bridge in between the government um, mission, government policy uh, implementation, and actually bring other players in the economy together, bring other private enterprises together. So, uh, so the, the, the role of uh, SOEs is really, they are not just um, a company, they are also mission driven, they, they have mission. So they will need to do certain things which may not be uh, viable or profitable for the private enterprises, but with the backing of the government, they will be able to pick it up and really work on something that government thinks is very important. So we call them not just uh, market driven, but they also mission driven. Uh, so they help the government fulfill the priorities of the country's domestic innovation, domestic um, uh, innovation, employment, wealth creation, new market creation, economic regeneration. So there are some really big uh, goals that government have in mind. They do rely on the, the SOEs in the first instance to try to, uh, try to bring that to fruition um, and bring other companies together. And to the second ones to competing internationally in strategically important areas for national security. Uh, as you can see, um, the, out of the 129 Chinese companies that made the Fortune 500 in 2019, 48 of them are central government owned enterprises. So you can see that they are actually uh, performing something uh, very, very important. We sometimes call them uh, national champion. Um, 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 which is kind of similar terminology that we use for other emerging markets. Uh, but in China, it, it's a little bit different in that sense. So I want to finish with this um, uh, slides. Um, so it, it's just to try, th this actually is quite interesting in the sense that uh, Professor Lundeville 
uh, talked about the experimenting, what the government good at. Uh, so here, if you look at the uh, the 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 low the so so the the top bit is kind of self-explanatory. We have government industry policy, right? As I said, you know, we have policy for safe China. We have policy for for new energy vehicles. We have policy for uh, for semiconductors, so on, uh, for different technological areas where innovations are very needed. Lots of effort and needed big resource. Uh, so they have certain policies uh, for for those sectors, and then they will then go to the state supported uh, state supported national champion or state owned enterprises. So they are to us they are very similar. Uh, for example, Huawei may not be a state owned enterprises, but they are very much uh, play, you know acting as a state supported national champion, and they will then uh, then link as a link to to the private owned followers or private owned enterprises. And then what the government, so the government needs, not every government is able to do this because it's a huge undertaking. So what the government is able to do this because the government has certain capabilities. Um, one is they have long-term strategic goal vision. One, they are very risk-taking and so they are good at experimenting. So we know that right from start of the reform, uh, the Chinese government has always uh, used this special economic zone to try to contain the risk, but also at the same time to take the risk and to experiment um, whether something is going to work or not. Um, so they always uh, have this smaller scale uh, they, 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 they have a vision they want to achieve, then they always have a smaller scale and to try to experiment uh, and then to see if that then uh, can be uh, spread to other regions. And so they have the, uh, the strategic making capability, but they also have implementation capability they need to implement. And that is where the state uh, supported national champion uh, comes to uh, to, to, to to this role uh, that that is very crucial for the government. Um, this is really just to look at uh, the government, uh, how they create this kind of uh, uh, demand, how they encourage uh, technological innovation. But of course, we you know we are uh, only at this stage where uh, we don't yet have a very have very uh, a very uh, good data to support this. Uh, we we have had some preliminary uh, results. Um, so, so these are the uh, few comp uh, companies in different sectors. Uh, in fact, Qinghua Uni Group, uh, the chip company, is recently being acquired by Alibaba, I understand. So, uh, so it's, it's, it's not, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a very, uh, uh, it's the opposite case. It's not being very, uh, it's not a very successful company, um, uh, but it's a private company. And then we have Hike Vision, which is very successful. We have uh, Jiangsu Henry Medicine, uh, which is a pharmaceutical company. Uh, so we're looking at the moment in the process, and of course, BYD, we're in the process of collecting data and looking at those cases and try to find uh, some of the uh, uh, interactions that we are uh, we have hypothesized in our, uh, our okay yeah and we predict that different types of companies will will take different decisions uh, when um, you know when they um, depending on whether private companies or state owned companies they will have different role to play yeah. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, this is a very broad brush, but I'm, I'm, I'm aware of the time and uh, thank you. Thank you, Jing. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you, the, uh, the lecture from let me, the- Let me stop Wang, mm -hmm. Yeah, Wang Ting, and uh, she has told us what she did in school and also the working experience with uh, Chris, um, Chris Freeman and as well as uh, her research. And um, I think it's perhaps we go for the lecture at first, then we have the more time and for discussion. 
Is this okay? okay. Yeah. yeah. And also that's a, um, Professor Wang, you have the time and to read the chats and the find <laughs> and think do. about your, yeah, your opinions. I will do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so now I think we welcome Professor Chen Jing and from Tsinghua University and to, to share her, uh, his experience and opinions on national innovation system. And welcome Professor Chen. Okay. Yes. Okay, good morning yes. and good evening. So, uh, today, tonight, I'm very happy to uh, talk about the innovation system in China. Uh, firstly, I'd like to uh, uh, thank uh, uh, Xu, uh, the, the new global uh, race uh, focus on innovation. Uh, in fact, the global innovation landscape is shaping uh, accelerating. So this year, China ranked 12th at the same time higher than Japan. And this year we are higher than Israel and Canada, uh, establishing itself as an innovation leader. So that's great. Uh, so the ranking by G Global Innovation Index 2021 uh, shows the rapid growth of China innovation uh, status. Also we can see, uh, China switched to uh, engineering based to technology based and finally to science based innovation. Uh, to create more uh, science engineering education uh, among the world. So we surface the United States to be the number one uh, paper publication country in the world. For technology uh, this year, uh, so patent application. We also can, can see from the data of uh, WIPO that China share almost 50 of the total patent application in data 2018 with very fast uh, growth. So China, uh, for this point of view, China switched uh, from technology border to uh, uh, parallel uh, working with Western country. Part of uh, area is uh, with leading in quantum computing and some big engineering uh, area. Uh, why? Uh, because we are continuously investing R&D and innovation. So last year, the R&D expenditure over GDP uh, exceeds uh, 2.4 percentage. That's great. We will uh, reach about uh, 2.6 uh, uh, in the next five years. It uh, expects to be reach about uh, 2.8 in 2035. So that's show the China catch up is very fast. So reason uh, behind the China fast uh, uh, growth in innovation. Uh, I like to thank we learn lots from uh, Western countries. We we learned from uh, MIT and Spru. So there are two stream to constitute the innovation studies in China. Uh, in China, one from US, especially from MIT. Another one is very important from uh, SPRU, University of Sussex. We thank all the scholars in these two units, especially the contribution by Chris Freeman. My colleague, uh, Di Jiangbo, uh, now is doing the chronicles uh, work uh, to analysis the the publication uh, by uh, Chris Freeman since year uh, 1966 to uh, 2010. And uh, even af uh, after he uh, passed away, we also can see that there are still, still the publications. And we do the uh, 
diagram uh, shows uh, what uh, Chris Fuchs. Uh, in fact, uh, Chris uh, Fuchs two uh, uh, three uh, four area. One is uh, what uh, what's a good uh, in, uh, economic system. Uh, how we see uh, see the technological uh, science technological progress, and how we uh, think uh, innovation and development, and how to design the national policy. And uh, we also see the network uh, by Fries, uh, Chris Freeman, with all the scholars uh, in the world. And uh, also the citation uh, uh, diagram by Chris Freeman. So that's great. So we'll finish this report by end of this year. Uh, the chronicle analysis of uh, publication uh, by Chris Freeman. We will publish uh, this paper and some journals. Why we started Fries, uh, Chris Freeman? Uh, because he very important to host uh, uh, a series of national innovation system. The national innovation system is very important the concept for China's catch up and the parallel uh, uh, progressing. Uh, as uh, Professor Liu Xin said, the national human system was uh, introduced uh, in China uh, around the uh, 1990, late 1990s, uh, but it is formally adopted by the Chinese government by the year uh, 2006. Uh, at that time, the uh, Chinese government uh, determined uh, to build an innovative uh, country and uh, focus on indigenous innovation. As Professor Liu mentioned that we have five innovation systems according to national innovation system concept. There is a knowledge innovation system, technology innovation system, service innovation system, regional innovation system, and civil and military collaborative innovation system, etc. So we do benefit uh, from the uh, concept of innovation system. So that's uh, the reason why China catches so, uh, so fast because we have a great, great uh, uh, contribution uh, by Chris Freeman. So this is the uh, can show that by our national innovation system thinking. Uh, so China government uh, launched the three steps of uh, innovation uh, strategy by year 2016. That means by 2020, China to be an innovative country. And by 2030, China to be top 10 innovative, innovation oriented country. And by 2050, uh, we try to become world class science, technology, and innovation powerhouse, and uh, become the major science center and innovation heights. Maybe after Italy, UK, France. Germany and the United States try to be a science center. We try to be an uh, innovative country. So that's, I think, the mostly contribute, uh, contributed by the uh, uh, theory, uh, by, by innovation system, national system. We have national uh, design for innovation. That's great. Thank you, thank uh, free, uh, Freeman so much. I met Chris in February uh, 2000, uh, year 2000. And also I thank uh, Dr. Ching Wang. Uh, Ching Wang also uh, make a bridge between me and uh, Spru, and also get an invitation for me. Uh, so I do, it, it, I'm indebted to you uh, about, uh, have, uh, and uh, by the end of my uh, visit, uh, I was surprised that uh, Chris Freeman went to uh, join my uh, reporting uh, reporting uh, uh, activity. Uh, it's very, it's very, it's very busy. So I, I remain this uh, picture. It's a very good memory for me. Uh, at that time, I, I'm, I was a very young scholar uh, with no fame, uh, but uh, Chris Freeman uh, joined my uh, seminar, uh, talk about the uh, innovation in China. That's great. So the benefit from VT uh, Spru, I think uh, I bring knowledge of innovation 
economics and also innovation management to China. Yeah, so very, very uh, important for me, for my research. Yeah. So I became the first scholar to study digital innovation system uh, at my PhD thesis uh, in 1979, uh, before uh, visiting Spru, because I got a book uh, uh, by uh, Richard Nelson. And also I read a book by uh, uh, Chris Freeman and also the book by uh, uh, Paul uh, uh, Rondwell. Uh, these three books uh, contributed to my PhD thesis. And also our research, my research projects, I focus on national system of technological innovation for China in 1995. And after that, I focus more uh, firm level. Uh, I try to apply uh, national innovation system concept to a firm level. As the Dr. Monty said, uh, so Professor Lundemann's work focus on corporate innovation system. I uh, also focus on co firm innovation system. And then uh, focus on the core competence-based innovation system uh, in 2015. And recently, uh, yes, I, I like to, uh, I plan to uh, also do some work, to apply a national uh, innovation system or national system of innovation to rural uh, innovation system in 2019. So all the research work by me, uh, all the uh, origin from the concept of innovation system, uh, that's great for me to, uh, to, uh, to get uh, uh, research. Uh, ahead, that's very important. For example, national innovation system by Freeman, Rodwell, and Nelson, and uh, Cook by regional innovation system, and uh, Maraba from uh, sector innovation systems, and uh, our research group works on firm innovation system. So, system is do a very important concept to generate and promote innovation. So, thanks so much. So, I think. The uh, national innovation system concept is uh, under development in China, still under development. So it's a new goal of common pers uh, prosperity since 2020. We need to use national innovation system theory better. I, I don't think we use this thing so good because, uh, so that means we should learn the theory uh, uh, of Chris Freeman. Well, uh, firstly, we think innovation system with a market mechanism but under socialism. That's different from Western countries. We need a new system concentrated national wide effects and the resources on key national undertakings. This is very special in China. In Chinese, we call it Xinxi This is very different from uh, pure market uh, system. So that means we need to design a new innovation system for China. We do need micro coordination. For example, Chinese government lack of inter, inter ministry collaboration. For example, the Commission of Development Reform, how to coordinate with most and the Ministry of Energy and Informationalization. How, the, how to coordinate, get a good coordination between most Minister of Science and Technology and the Minister of Education. Currently, it's still very poor. But we need to get the two ministers to work well to promote the learning society, supported by uh, Lonova. How to promote the learning society? It is still, still a long way. How get the innovation for regional and coordinated development? Because China is still a big gap among regions. So coast area is very rich, but the northeast of China is very poor. That's very dangerous. How to get the coordinated development? That's very important. So we, that means, we, should we still remain the five-year plan? I do remember the uh, discussion with uh, Chris Freeman that uh, uh, the advantage of, of Chinese government lies in uh, the, the uh, five-year plan uh, by Chinese government. 
she said it is an advantage for China. So how we will use the five-year plan as a, as a policy measure to promote the, the, the solve the problem of uh, uneven development uh, among the regions. And also how we get the innovation for sustainable development. As you, you know, the China now is promoting the uh, uh, two carbon uh, uh, policy. And also uh, we like the book by uh, Dreamland, how we innovate for hope, uh, the well being. So I, I think we need to uh, uh, re-study the theory of uh, Chris Freeman and use the theory well to promote China uh, still a uh, uh, good, uh, good way uh, towards innovation. So that's, I think we, we need to learn uh, further. So because uh, in new uh, Chinese uh, uh, goal, we are called innovation under a uh, newcomer perspective. So this is a new uh, uh, situation for China. So in China, we should solve them uh, about the goal of industrialization, informationization, urbanization, and agricultural modernization. And at the same time, we should keep our environment uh, sound and also focus more on our health care because we are approaching an aging society. We try to make our uh, the world peace and uh, enjoy the international affair with peace effect, etc. So that's the thing. We, we still need, need to use the innovation uh, system here well to help China. That may be during uh, the development economics uh, because Jupiter economics focus on the enterprises. And the uh, new Jupiter economics posted by Chris Freeman, as well as Ronwell and uh, Richard Nelson. It's very, very important. So uh, this year, I translated the uh, Elke, uh, Elke uh, champion to new Jupiter economics. So Chinese government should understand new Jupiter economics, now, not just to promote the enterprise innovation, but also how to get to the uh, uh, stronger public support to the private uh, sector innovation. So we, do, we need to use the concept well, that means PPP, that means public, public and private partnership. We're still very weak in kind of such kind of partnership because the most of our R&D institutions get to uh, private. That's not so good. We need to set up our uh, state-owned or government-owned R&D institution and the university system to help our entrepreneurs and small and medium enterprises. This is still a tough job for China. And by this work, we may be generated called cost to Peterlin economics. That's the work we try to do by Tsinghua University Research Group. So I think we uh, like to uh, uh, work with all the uh, scholars in innovation uh, study area uh, to promote our innovation uh, system concept well on the Chinese uh, circus list. Uh, so that's uh, my uh, presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, the presentation from Professor Chen Jing. And I think now, and we move into the Q and A time. And uh, um, I think Andrew have several questions as well as uh, Renoir also have several the questions. And I I believe you are online, and perhaps you can ask the presenters mm. directly. Yeah. So, yeah, and Andrew, and please, yeah. Um, thank you very much. And in the chat, we've already had some uh, interchange. Um, uh, I'm very grateful to be here representing LALIX and also the Global League Scientific uh, Board. Um, 
I, I had a question about uh, innovation capabilities in non-metropolitan in regions. And if you see these non-metropolitan regions having their own style of, of innovation systems and maybe focusing on you know, their, their own regional specificities, maybe their local traditional industries that are, are in some way um, having a new dynamics uh, with, with connections to new technologies or um, somehow new connections to uh, markets uh, um, that are now more, you know, direct possibilities to get to markets um, with, with this kind of innovative uh, local um, traditional uh, mm -hmm. products that maybe were way too far away from markets uh, before. Um, so I just, you know, if there's some, some some reflection on that, that would be interesting. Besides, you know, the national and the big stories that we're that we're used to hearing from China. Uh, that's great. Uh, thank you for Andrew for your great, uh, good question. Uh, so actually, in China, there's a uh, uh, three area uh, focus on uh, metropolitan uh, innovation system. That means the uh, uh, Yangtze Delta River. Uh, uh, ability and uh, uh, poor, poor river delta, uh, mature, that means Macau, Hong Kong, and uh, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, etc. And also Beijing, Beijing, uh, and uh, Hebei province, and uh, uh, Tianjin, province, Tianjin city. So, also the uh, delta. So, there are three uh, delta uh, to constitute our uh, three metropolitan uh, uh, image system. We also set up an innovation center uh, uh, to work for this. This also constitutes our national innovation uh, system. So we consider a city innovation system, not a rural area. The city is very important, especially the big city. It's a very key part of innovation. Well, just the complimentary, okay. some of <laughs> okay, the changing. Uh, yeah, in China, I think uh, uh, Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen is the most the density of a uh, region for, uh, yeah, as you say, so much more as more international, more good talents. But in some of uh, towns, uh, like uh, yeah, the Chengjing, Zhejiang, we are all are from Zhejiang province. So Zhejiang, even Guangdong, Jiangsu, Shandong, in those four regions, I think there are lots of um, you know, more say, traditional industry, but there are also entrepreneurship uh, and they are, I, I think you know, in your conversation, I say, uh, first of all, they are more in cluster-based uh, way. So that uh, many small ME and uh, say they can, I think in some ways, uh, like a martial <laughs> cluster. But uh, now I think uh, they are trying to change it because uh, the digital technology came, okay? So that how can they access more like uh, Alibaba's platform? Now how can they that uh, connect it to more, for example, uh, university research? And I think originally they are care about uh, how can they connect the global market? But uh, now I think they are more like to the how can we access knowledge uh, because they need upgrading their technology. So I think there are some of the stories about how you those like towns or counties change their patterns. I think there are some professors doing that. Um, but I can maybe I can find some of the paper later. Okay, thank you, <laughs> thank you, thank, thank you. Mm. And any other questions or that like you uh, um. Bao and do you have any questions and to the presenters? And the Lachi and the welcome and for your question. Yeah, my question is to Professor King Wong. About the efficiency, I had put the question in the chat. How efficient are the state-owned enterprises in China? And if they are efficient, what are the measures the Chinese government adopt to maintain them at their efficiency level? I am comparing the situation with India, where now there's a spree of disinvestment. Companies, government-owned companies are running, even the airline is running out of profit, mismanaged, and they are 
in a selling spree. So how does China manage? Mm -hmm. You are mute. Yeah, yeah Professor Wong, and you are mute now. <laughs> I can hear my I can hear myself talking, mm -hmm. <laughs> but not any anybody else. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is a great question. In fact, the state-owned enterprises have always been a, 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 a headache for for the Chinese government mm -hmm. uh, since the the reform uh, 30, 40 years ago. So we are not not really talking about any state-owned enterprises. Uh, we are talking about. Uh, you know, so there is, a, there's a, there, there have been lots of reforms to try to solve the efficiency problem, and, and also there are some sector related. You know, there are some uh, old energy sectors, coal mines, you know, um, steel industry, and so many industries in the north west northeast of China, right? Uh, used to be very much state owned enterprises and uh, high employment, uh, major employers. And they, they, they have been actually through a major restructuring. So what we are seeing now, the state-owned enterprises where I am referring to are the new breed of state-owned enterprises who have become very strong, very competitive. So we are really not talking about, so the state-owned enterprises, they are still ones which we need to try to sort them out because they are not efficient, because they are outdated, because the, 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 the skills of the workers are outdated. Um, but uh, for the ones which have got potential, for example, the high-speed rail, for example, the new energy, for example, the uh, uh, the, the, the high vision, which, yeah, which was a state-owned enterprise. What it did was to have the uh, to, 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 to have the investors, private investors, so PPP, that's what uh, Jin Chen is referring to. So in fact, it's more the new breed of state-owned enterprises. It's a, it's, it's a new breed of state-owned enterprises where they have uh, private public government um, uh, partnerships to, to, to have to, you know, to actually make it a much more competitive. Yeah. Okay. I hope that answers your question. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so now I think it's the turn then for the carrot and welcome your question. Yeah, carrot, now it's your turn. Carlotta. Ah, thank you. Yeah. Yes, I, I wanted to continue on that question about the state-owned enterprises, the modern ones, because uh, there are two things that I find interesting. One is when you said that they're all also mission oriented, not, not only profit. Uh, I imagine that means that there is a particular way of getting them to know what their mission is and also of evaluating how they are fulfilling the mission together with how successful they are being in innovation or in profitability or whatever. Mm. I wondered if there was, if there was some system because there are several of them and because it's such a big country and it's so complex is there a, a, a way of doing it or, or is it just each one differently and the other question I had has to do with the fact that as far as I know Alibaba for instance has managed to facilitate the incorporation of thousands of little companies, SMEs all over the country, mm -hmm. and also the possibility of people being able to pay even though they don't have a bank. I mean, all these things that Alibaba has, has been able to solve, uh, are there things in the state-owned enterprises that, that look at problems of that sort, which is the incorporation of the whole population into, into you know, both producing and, and consuming. Uh, is this part of the missions? Is there, how, how, does the, how does it compare? And is it valued? I mean, is it understood that this is quite, a, quite an interesting result that Alibaba has achieved with the private, you know, in a private uh, sector company? So it's... 
Thank you, Carol, for your good questions. My, uh, let me answer your questions. Uh, so, firstly, I think uh, maybe uh, in Western country you may ask misunderstanding the the innovative uh, capability of state-owned enterprises. Actually, most uh, Chinese state-owned enterprises is very innovative. It's better than private one. Why? Because the, the leader of the of the uh, state enterprises are very pretty coordinated. They wish uh, this will uh, achieve a, a high uh, economic uh, return as well as a social responsibility. So uh, in recent years, they are uh, requested to uh, pre very important for uh, uh, innovation performance. For example, they are asked to be uh, the monitor of uh, industry to keep the technology security, to uh, grasp the key technologies. So the uh, uh, in fact, the state enterprise invests a lot in R and D investment, and uh, as, a, as a result, they get a good innovation performance. For example, uh, state state grid of China, they get uh, over uh, ten thousand patents uh, every year. That's very high. That's very high. They can get a technology uh, of. Uh, High voltage transmission, electric transmission. And also, another example has to be Qi, is also uh, state owned enterprises. So that's different from uh, other countries. So, so most uh, innovation, because China is a very big country, we need the uh, innovation in infrastructure. Private company cannot do more in infrastructure. Private company like mm -hmm. Alibaba. Just to consumer, consumer goods. But the private company, they are, the the problem is focused on pro profit to more. This is uh, called this is the the stockholder, stockholder, not a stakeholder. They just uh, pay more into the money making. Even there is no money to the mid companies, but the interest is very high. It's not so good. But the state of enterprises, the state bank cannot do that one. So state bank, like uh, China people, uh, uh, commercial, in the commercial bank, they get a very low interest to the small and medium, unlike Alibaba. So Alibaba is not so good. So this is very different. <laughs> story. This is not different. So Alibaba is the biggest P2P. This is called, called internet-based loan. It's very good. It's very, very bad one. They're very, very well. Also, it encourages the young generation to, to, to use the money for easily without paying more attention to how to return. Let's uh, draw lots of young, young, young men in China to lay down. We know lay down, just uh, do nothing, like some Jap Japanese man. So that's, that's good. That's good. So in contrast, so Bank of China and the Bank of uh, Industry Commercial Bank is very profitable. They do good for social responsibility. So that's a different story from Western country. <laughs> now now I, I, I do lots of work to introduce a good, good example of Chinese student enterprises. I'm moving from Zhejiang. Uh, Zhejiang is lots of private company, but they just make money. They have no technologies. They just make money. That's not so good. So innovation not just to make money. Innovation try beyond the big money. It should pay more attention to the social components, as the Donald Well said, for social balance, social justice is very important, not just the money. That's my comment. Uh, I have a little different from Qingjing. Yeah. I yeah. think uh, China is a large country. They are I, some years ago I, I say China has a two different innovation system. <laughs> One is uh, maybe is a uh, the uh, SOE dominated the innovation system in like infrastructure. And one, I think, uh, more profit uh, enterprises uh, dominated the innovation system. It's like Alibaba, Huawei, and others. They are more good at, uh, like, uh, say, uh, like digital technology, uh, more in, like, in, as I uh, say, more, say, 
consumer products uh, sectors. So I think uh, they are in different sector, uh, they are in different uh, function, I think different uh, capability. I think this is maybe is a more uh, Chinese also picture. It's a, it's a little different from uh, <laughs> okay. okay, can I just, um, um, it's nice to have different views, yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, to answer your question, Carlotta, um, Alibaba has done, has made huge contribution to, to Chinese economy, mm -hmm. right? For many things that you've mentioned. Mm -hmm. However, there's one problem with that model is that there's a hollow kind of that made the manufacturing. So the Chinese government policy is to uh, strengthen the, manu the, the high quality manufacturing industry mm. uh, and for the strategic purposes, right? As we know, especially now with the geopolitical flashpoints that China is no longer able to have the global um, economic model that China has successfully implemented for, for the past 30 years where we have complementarities and we can buy some of the equipments uh, that we cannot produce. And then we can focus on our comp comparative advantages. That has become uh, gradually more and more difficult because of the geopolitical flashpoints. And so China has had a, a, a major strategic turn, turning point where need to, it becomes strategically important to have all the high level uh, manufacturing capabilities. However, having that old model of Alibaba and, uh, and also Evergrande, as you know, the property uh, the, uh, company that have uh, absorbed too much investment into those sectors that the government is no longer considering as the strategic important sectors. Um, so I think there is a rebalancing in terms of a restructuring of the industry. And that is uh, the backdrop is the geopolitical uh, uh, issue. So, but Ali Baba, uh, but uh, I, I, Zhejiang has some manufa good manufacturing companies apart from Ali Baba. Jili, you probably know that has been the car manufacturing has been very successful example actually of a private enterprises of acquiring an uh, international uh, uh, global uh, multinational company um, Volvo and actually have made the success of it and now has been uh, on the IPO uh, in the stock market in Norway and has has, uh, has uh, the market ma market uh, value has uh, has um, more than 10 times of when it's supported from Ford so the private enterprises have have certain uh, I mean, that's why in my, in my um, diagram, I have the private enterprises that are the important players, but Chen Jing is right that the infrastructure, the huge infrastructure projects would have to be coordinated uh, uh, by the state-owned enterprises with huge resource backing. Um, so to answer your question, Carlotta, about how they make sure that the mission is being passed on to. So what are the punishments, right? I, I think these two sides, there's punishment, but there's also reward. So again, the government, uh, in terms of um, um, the, the sort of the, the, the state-owned enterprises, especially the central government-owned enterprises, the, the head of the enterprise is equivalent it's actually official, government officials. So they have the same ranking. So they actually, they, they, they are like, so there is a, there's, a, there's a direct line of command. Uh, and it could be, uh, and uh, according to how good they perform their job, they may be removed, they may be promoted and may become minister if they do well in that enterprise. Uh, so there, there's that um, also, um, yeah, point. So I, I just add to that. Yeah. Thank you. Welcome. Okay. Yeah, so now it's the time and for the M MMU and MMU. 
And I think it's the time now for your question. Yeah. Um. Uh, I think I cannot. Can you hear me now? Now it's yes. Now I can hear Good. you. Good. Yeah. Yes. I I want to ask. Uh, is it possible that China didn't have um, big size companies, and then uh, the government owned companies had to take the place of those big companies? So, because in uh, an innovation ecosystem, you need large organizations, uh, big firms to be able to accumulate capabilities and then also innovate. So, is it possible that uh, where you have the absence of these big companies, the state owned companies were able to fill the gap before you now talk about having? this trans, um, the transition where you now have a new set of companies that are coming on. Because I want to see what an, an African like me could learn from the Chinese innovation system and how it emerged. Thank you. Thank you, Abel. Let me answer, uh, let me answer your question. Uh, now China uh, is considering how to balance the innovation capability between large state-owned enterprises and a small private company. So uh, I think next year, by early next year, we will launch called the uh, Innovation Consortium Program. Innovation Consortium that uh, uh, ask the uh, large company work with small company work together. So uh, next year, we are uh, organized about 20 Innovation Consortium, not just the university, just uh, the collaboration between uh, big firms and uh, large firms, they work together to organize a called the industry to keep the industry work well. So that's uh, the, the uh, viewpoint, not just the micro, it's a meso level. So meso level is not just uh, regional, it's just uh, how the uh, different uh, uh, companies work well. This very uh, important uh, policy will uh, put forward uh, next year. So that then can pre all the rules of different uh, uh, different uh, uh, companies. So small companies, we still have uh, space. Uh, so this year we put forward called the like specialty and focus like uh, German. Uh, Germany uh, called Innovation Champion to promote the development of uh, small and immediate enterprises. At the same time, we uh, ask our uh, big state owned company, companies to help uh, this small company. This different. So, this different from uh, traditional university industry linkage. This is called the uh, big and the small linkage in China. That's my uh, answer. And the Professor Liu, do you have any the opinions or comments sent to the question? About the big company and small company? Uh, I didn't hear very clear. It's about the, the big company and SME, how they collaborate. Okay. Oh, yeah. Anyway, I think it's okay. So perhaps we now move into um, Bender Lundval, yeah. and yeah. I think yeah, welcome your comments hmm. or opinions or questions. Uh, recently, over the last uh, year, um, uh, the leaders of China have. Uh, introduced uh, different kinds of regulations in relation to uh, uh, Alibaba and uh, mm -hmm. other uh, of these giant uh, 
uh, mm -hmm. tech giants. And, mm -hmm. and my question uh, to you is, do you have, um, do you have any idea how this will uh, affect the innovation system uh, of China? I mean, these are really big players. Um, uh, the first effect we saw was that the market value was uh, uh, strongly reduced. Uh, but I'm interested in another question. I mean, how will it affect and, and do you have a lively debate now in China about this question or, or and, and what are the different positions? Thank you. Thanks for that another way. It was a great, good question. Why we did the uh, heavy regulation? Because this is a private company, uh, not keep the, uh, the data so, uh, so well. They use the data, personal data. This is not so good. Because this data is a national security in some time. And also they are uh, paying more attention to the money making. I think uh, uh, we'll, maybe we lost uh, some market, market value, but uh, we'll uh, help our people work well. So uh, I, 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 as I told that uh, this uh, problem is a private company uh, has low uh, social responsibility. That's not so good. So we should solve a problem. So currently regulation is, is, is necessary. How will it affect the national innovation system? Uh, so in, in some area we are, uh, the folks are more com competitive policy, not the industry policy. So make more competitive. We don't like uh, company is too big. We like to uh, give more space to small small enterprises. And they chill in. Huh? Me? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I can make some comments. I think. Uh, Thanks, Lundwai, for your good question. In some way, I think in Chinese we are muted. <laughs> Uh, we are we cannot say much about this issue. Uh, I think there is both a political and also maybe for other reasons to think about how can regulate Alibaba and other digital platform company. Uh, maybe in some way changing right is and uh, is uh, uh, for the last of the twenty years. Uh, they are uh, developed so fast is that sometimes the government w w worry that they are out of control <laughs> because they are uh, combined, uh, say, market force, uh, financial power, and even digital power. So they have many powers like uh, digital uh, market and uh, users. So this is as that any government uh, like a bank, uh, as a Chinese big SOE cannot do it. So as the government thinking they are more powerful in some ways than the also of SLE. So that the government thinking is time to control them. <laughs> so this is my observation. <laughs> I, I will I, I would I would agree with Xieling on that. I think there, there's um, there's two sides to a story. Um, uh, certainly uh, Alibaba because I'm studying uh, I'm studying the, uh, the sort of um, the date you know the mar marketing if you like you know in terms of what kind of power uh, big powerhouses like Alibaba and Tencent, have in China, right? And you compare that with Facebook, with Google, with Amazon, uh, and you see they probably have much greater power in China than their counterparts in the US because they've developed so fast that the regulations were lagging behind, which is a typical characteristic of a technological Evol development, mm -hmm. especially in such rapid development in China, like China. Mm -hmm. um, it's very much lagging behind. Uh, so they had unbridled mm -hmm. kind of development 
for, for too long. And in particular, they really, I think the consumers also suffer from that. So we are probably the, the data. So we say channel uh, straddling. So their data does not, res, does not, uh, restri it's not restricted to one particular area. For example, traveling, for example, shopping, right? So, the, or entertaining. They, they, because they are basically doing everything, entertaining, shopping, you know, social media, uh, everything across the whole different channels. So they can basically know your habit from the moment you get, you wake up to the moment you go to sleep. They may even know how good your, your dreams are, your sleeps are, because then they also have those apps where monitoring your, your, your sleep pattern. Um, and, and the data, obviously you need to protect consumers, but I think more importantly, the data has also become very highly sensitive, right? In, in some areas, um, like what the government officials, what time they come out of their office, what time they go to home, you know, what time, what, what transport they take. So they have too many data. And then the US now government requires every, every company who want to go on IPO to read, to reveal, to disclose all the data, right? To disclose so much data that, that the government, the China government feels it's no longer viable uh, proposition for these companies. So what the government did first was to stop Ant, right? Go on IPO. That was the first sign the government started to bring in uh, control uh, because the, the requirement, data requirement for such IPO is just beyond, um, the, you know, beyond the beyond question. So I think they, they are two sides to a story, uh, but we, but I agree that we need to have a debate about this. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for the question and the comments and from the three, um, uh, three professors, and now it's the turn and to the Yu Shi Chen, and so welcome your question. Oh, yeah, I, I'm not to uh, answer to, uh, I try to ask a question, but I, I'm trying to answer that Andrew and uh, Karuta addressed the question. Uh, on the one side, I think uh, Alibaba and those uh, uh, big tech co company enable enables the new business model such as consumer to manufacture, which is a business model connecting with uh, manufacturers with consumer that removes the traditional logistic uh, inventory sales distribution and these uh, intermediary sectors enable um, customer can buy higher quality products and lower price. But um, this from the new business model perspective. But uh, now, uh, since the data has a new fact production factor, so those uh, platform-based company somehow enlarge the digital dividend be between the customer and the, the SMEs. So they can upcharge the um, interest from both sides. Uh, that's also the challenge from all global big tech companies. Sometimes because uh, as the data become uh, more important, sometimes those uh, big tech companies also act as a public infrastructure. That's uh, the, uh, from government side, that's uh, the key to keep uh, public uh, infrastructure, keep wells. Um, and as uh, Professor Chen Jin mentioned, this may be the fundamental question about the business model in capitalism, because the key is to maximizing stakeholders value, not um, uh, shareholders value, not stakeholders value. So that may um, also a challenge for all the uh, big tech companies to shift the wheel from uh, pure uh, interest driven to embrace more uh, like a public value. That's kind of my view, thanks. And also uh, I'm through students, so I'd glad to be here and uh, listen to all uh, professors uh, talk about uh, our founders, <laughs> thanks. Thank you. And so, uh, Carlot and Cheers, I think it's your turn and for any other question or the comments. 
Yeah, Carlotta, now it's your mute. You are mute now. You are mute now. We cannot hear. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Uh, looking at a at a very big, you know, the the big picture. Uh, China has up to now developed mainly as an export oriented uh, economy. And the latest uh, government things that we have heard from Xi Jinping and so on, uh, seem to be uh, turning to the domestic market somehow by saying that the big company should, should pay better and should worry about the consumers. I mean, there is this thing which is, of course, what all golden ages have been about, is to create demand somehow so that business can really grow and so that production can really grow. Is there somewhere, is, is it beginning to look like uh, China would want to have a stronger domestic market rather than depend, being so dependent on exports considering the tensions that have now grown? Is that how you see it? Okay, let me answer, answer your question. We China are now at the called the dual, uh, dual uh, circulation uh, strategy. This is one way uh, we focus our upgrading of uh, domestic market uh, uh, consumption. Because China uh, last year the 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 uh, income per capita is over ten thousand US dollar. That we have a uh, high uh, uh, domestic demand uh, to promote the Chinese economic uh, development growth. Uh, so, in the in the circulation is a main main loop. But in the same time, we try to also like to be more open, especially with the country in one belt and one load uh, area. Also, we try to with. Uh, uh, work with uh, BRICS, etc., or uh, China Portugal collaboration, etc. So uh, we try to work hard to expand to keep uh, original international security. But uh, obviously, currently we are, there's uh, the dual, the, the the double, the double security uh, strategy is our uh, is our choice is our choice. Yeah, I have just very quick, uh, quick, um, um, you know, just very quickly respond to that. China, because I'm studying the consumption side of it quite a lot. China actually has become a huge uh, consumption market, consumer market already. So it hasn't, uh, I think, has not been just export led for quite some time. So if you look at the uh, the, the luxury. Uh, goods market. That is really good example of that. Yes, the luxury goods market uh, since 2010, um, it, has, uh, it has really uh, grown exponentially because of, the uh, because of the increasing middle class consumers. Um, so now, uh, even after the pandemic, now the, the, the Chinese market for luxury consumption uh, is the biggest in the world. So it has 40% of the total market share for the, for the luxury. So LV, uh, Chanel, Hermes, they all set up big stores in China. Even when they are reducing their sales out uh, elsewhere, they are still... Um, so China has become a huge market, a very attractive market. Um, so what are the Chinese... But what your point is a valid one, because what the Chinese government tried to do is that to, to, to um, try to push the Chinese consumers to buy... buy um, Chinese own brands rather than by Western brands. Uh, so there is this movement of uh, a patriotic uh, kind of movement of buying, buying uh, made in China. Um, and uh, there have been some uh, brands which benefited from this movement, this sentiment of, of buying something which is actually made in China rather than uh, made in, in the West. So I think that is, that, is, that is changing. Perhaps you will see more Chinese consumers buying Chinese brands rather than buying Western brands. 
Mm. Yeah. But precisely what I had understood was that there was a big inequality, as always in installation periods of technological revolutions and when countries are forging ahead from behind, normally the new technologies produce a very strong polarization of income. So you have a lot of richer people, which are that luxury market, but not so many, uh, you know, the, the middle class and the, and the lifting of, of the lower classes doesn't necessarily happen in the early periods of forging ahead. So I feel that China is somewhat seems to be wanting to pick up the bottom of the income distribution by, by producing locally for the lower ranks also, not only for the luxury market. Is that yes. actually happening? Is, there a poli is that yes. clear? Because it, it seems like that from the things we get in the West. I'm so glad, Carlotta, you, met, you point that out. That's precisely why Chris Freeman's contribution is national system innovation, the inequality. That, that has to be the social inequality has to be addressed. And Chinese government, this new policy of common prosperity is not just a slogan. It's actually trying to do exactly what you said. It's trying to have several different layers of, of supply and services to meet different layers of demand. And, and I think Chen Jing's study on the rural areas, you know, it must be trying to address that, uh, that as well. So it's trying to avoid precisely that, uh, that gap at being, uh, yeah, being inequality, actually, yeah. that's right, the inequality, yes. Yeah, that was the early stage of China's development it was a huge inequality. And the, the government has noticed that. And now the government has uh, put, so they say fairness and efficiency. So now they are not, they are balancing fairness with efficiency rather than just efficiency, just GDP. Before GDP is the single-handedly most important goal, but now they say fairness and, 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 and efficiency uh, and growth. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, just one comment is that uh, the Chinese government also say uh, economic security is our top, uh, top priority. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, we, if we are too open, so China is so big, so they like to say, how can we make our economic system more accountable? <laughs> I think this is, so you can see many may be called security reason. This is also very, very important. Yeah. Yes, I agree, uh, Xie Ling, and also uh, Dr. Qing, Qing Wang, that uh, uh, in Chinese uh, uh, party documentation last year, the first priority is security. Yeah. <laughs> second, second is innovation. <laughs> consumption is about tense priority. <laughs> consumption and investment. So there's a different uh, development role. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, now try to pay more attention to uh, called uh, SDG, uh, Sustainable Development Goal, Goals, 17 Goals. Now put uh, in the uh, high and high priority in uh, the government, uh, both central and the local government priority. So, uh, so eco ecosystem, uh, uh, environment protection is very high priority. So there are two important, first is the rural development, second is green development. There's a child, not just economic growth, economic growth, so the purity. That's my comment. So I think it's, uh, we have, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, before I think you have, uh, I, I may know I have the question and now it's no, put the hand. Yeah. Okay, can I ask the question quickly? Yeah, um, the last question, yeah, welcome. Good, so, um, you said the Chinese companies are mission oriented. Good. Since they are mission oriented, and uh, one of the professors, um, Liu, was able to say that you have big companies matched with small companies. So there is uh, a consortium of firms that work together, and then you see innovation. So we have seen. Chinese companies dominate some African countries in some sectors. Um, you have them in the mining sector now. 
Um, in Nigeria, you see them mining gold, uh, mining some other mineral ores. So as part of the mission of the Chinese uh, company, do you have them where they can share technology with uh, smaller African countries? Um, like you have them in Nigeria, in the markets which they dominate, is it part of what you have in your innovation system that they could share some technologies with uh, the small firms we have in Nigeria? But the case is that we find out that once they enter into any market, into any sector, you find that the Nigerian firms leave and the, the Chinese um, firms take over the market, however small they look like, but they, they tend to have the capabilities to displace the other smaller firms that had been there. So is it part of the responsibility which you, you see in these firms to transfer some technologies to the local firms? Thank you. Okay, let's be answer your question. It's a good question. I believe the technology uh, level in mining industry is uh, not uh, very advanced. We adopt uh, good technologies. Uh, like uh, uh, 5G technologies to help our uh, uh, mining uh, very digital, called e-mining, e-mine, uh, supported by Huawei technology, 5G. Also, we try to test uh, uh, called uh, no people uh, degree technology. That means uh, remote, uh, remote, uh, remote uh, uh, air prayer to, to to generate technologies and also reduce the, the explosion technologies, also very good. So if you're interested, you can email me. I can introduce some uh, miners to uh, technology, minor technology to you and transfer to the Africa. That's very good for the security and uh, uh, innovation in Africa mine, mine industry. Uh, anything and uh, um, perhaps it's uh, now the end of the uh, session and I think it's a welcome that's the uh, one sentence or one comment and from three professors. Yeah, who would like you to have that, uh, to say it at first. Uh, Professor Wang, and you are mute now. Sorry. Yes, uh, one comment. Um, I, I just, uh, I'm very um, happy to be here, to see some old friends, um, but also to, to have so many questions. Um, I really, I, more than I expected, and um, some of the online lectures, you don't get many, questions so I, I, I just bring me back to the sprue days again i'm really happy to be here so that's my one sentence thank you very much for coming so for me it's also great uh, a good uh, a good night for me to meet all the innovation uh, group uh, like lodewell and the uh, pedals etc uh, so i thank so much uh, also we also thank uh, chris freeman as I think in the past uh, uh, 30 years, we finished the stage of translation, your wonderful books. But how to apply your theory in China is not uh, so well. So in the next uh, uh, next uh, few research area, I apply your theory well in China, because now we have more chance to uh, join the policy design for Chinese government. So um, translation is, uh, is the one, one side, but how to use your theory is a, is a very uh, tough task, but it's worthy for uh, our Chinese scholars to do that one. So uh, please uh, give more advice uh, uh, during the process. Thank you so much. Okay, I'll say some words. I think it's uh, really ex exciting and uh, unexpected. I think maybe it's a few people and then I think it's uh, many, many people, especially I think international friends joined the CIS of uh, uh, say it's a work, work, workshop and I'm really happy and uh, to to talk and uh, exchange ideas with uh, all sorts of friends and uh, thanks I think uh, and uh, it seems like a uh, 
We we are say Chinese issue is also still as a, like a global issue, <laughs> so I think I'll love to see later. Okay, to exchange your research, uh, your travel. Thanks. Mm. Oh, thank you, and thank you for thank all you. that uh, speaks and uh, all that participants. Mm. And if you have any question or the comments, and the welcome to send me email. Yeah, and yeah. I will share with all the yeah. speaks. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Jing, for organizing it. Yeah. Thank you, Jing. Thank you. Good, good thank afternoon, you. good evening, so, thank you. good morning. We like to uh, host uh, the link and uh, welcome uh, to Beijing again. So, not well, please come to yeah. Beijing again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bye. Okay, bye bye. Bye bye.